Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so, so as Ron mentioned, I'm, I'm currently at a, a company called Grail, and uh, part of what we're trying to do is develop effectively an, an assay that allows us to test a cancer at an early stage. And this is a surprisingly computational intensive problem. Uh, and because of that, we uh, needed to invest fairly heavily in computational infrastructure as well. And one of the sort of ubiquitous components of doing um, you know, data infrastructure work, uh, especially in bioinformatics, but also in many other domains, is this notion of data workflow systems. And so let's dig in a little bit about what, what I mean by that so we're all on the same page. And so these systems are often similar to the kinds of systems we use for software builds, but they have slightly different constraints and, and dynamics. So for example, most of the uh, work, most of the jobs that, that we, uh, we run in data processing systems can take days or hours, not minutes, that you might expect from a, um, a software build system. The volume of data is often uh, much, much higher. We can deal with terabytes and, and maybe even petabytes of data, not gigabytes or, or megabytes like you might in a, in a software build system. And also, the, uh, the, the, the data workflow systems tend to require dynamism. You tend to be able to have to make decisions about data processing with you based on uh, the actual input data or the output of certain, certain stages, whereas build systems tend to be much more static. So another distinction that I think is important to make is that when I'm talking about these data workflow systems, we're talking about what I'll, what I'll call file grain systems. And so these are, are systems where you're piecing together external tools that do some part of a computation and they effectively form a, a dependency graph. And not these kind of fine-grained data processing systems like Hadoop or Spark um, and, and others like that. These sort of systems are, are ubiquitous in uh, so-called ETL workloads and are very, very common uh, in, in the kind of bioinformatic workloads that, that we do at Grail and, and in many other places as well. So if we, we survey the existing um, landscape of workload systems, we find out there's a lot of them. There's, you know, seems to be sort of a starter project for uh, most bioinformatics startups to, to create our own, you know, sort of workflow systems. And uh, but when you when you sort of inspect that more deeply, you find that most of the existing systems out there are fairly thin front ends that perhaps expose some sort of embedded DSL in Python uh, or maybe a, a, a way of declaratively specifying uh, build pipelines in, in something like YAML. And then they tend to target backend systems like Kubernetes or AWS Batch or some combination of these. Usually there's not a lot of coherence in these systems in the sense that they're all very, very different. Uh, though the commonality they tend to have is that you have to sort of specify manual dependency graphs uh, and it tends to be uh, you know, very, fairly kludgy to deal with. So we made a few observations about the state of the art. So the first is that uh, really most of the existing systems out there uh, were entirely too mechanical. And what I mean by that is that in order to specify a build pipeline, you would often have to explicitly piece together a dependency graph to arrive at the, the result that you desire. Right? And also these systems lack the data model. They were effectively just a way of uh, coordinating execution and dependencies between tasks but the actual inputs and outputs of, um, of those tasks were invisible to the, the actual uh, workflow processing systems themselves. And, uh, and as we'll see a little bit later, this is a very, very important distinction and one that gets us a lot of leverage down the road if we take a different approach. Finally, we wanted to make we made the observation that workflows are actually you know, really just programs. The fact that we're creating these dependency graphs is a little bit like you know, programming in an assembly language. Uh, the, it's not the graph itself that the graph itself rather isn't the artifact that we're interested in. Um, it's really just an incidental implementation detail. And what we really want to do is we just want to program a, a, a data processing task um, that we wish to perform. So we decided to uh, sort of consider this and 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 start over again and see what we could arrive at. So, what is Replo? Well, Replo is a, a functional language. Uh, it has static types, mostly inferred. Uh, it has a module system, so we can uh, apply modern sort of software engineering practices to the work that we do. Of course, it has to be able to compose external tools. This is really the reason for its, its, its very existence, right? And so uh, the language allows you to seamlessly uh, compose external tools that you specify. 
Refill does impose a data model, so it requires uh, the individual tasks within the workflows, within the program, to be referentially transparent. And that has important implications down the road that we'll get, we'll get into later. Repo can also, or rather, is purely incremental in the sense that uh, when you ask Repo to compute something, it will always compute the smallest set of, of, of computations that it has to do in order to reconcile what it is that you want to compute with what has been computed before. And that's really, really important also for these kinds of workloads uh, and a direct effect of, of defining and specifying a strict data model. Reflow is also implicitly parallel, and so it can parallelize any uh, task that, that, that can be parallelized. It does so, th uh, does so through data flow semantics, and we'll get to that uh, later as well. And then finally, one thing that we really, really wanted to, to make sure, um, uh, or one, one property that we found to be really, really important, is that Reflow sort of just work. It should be a tool where you can write a program, and uh, you can simply run it. And whatever resources are required to run that program should be dynamically provisioned by, by Reflow. And so Reflow actually implements its own cluster computing manager for that reason. And, and that might seem a, a little strange, but actually you can get away with a very, very simple solution, uh, which I'll also get into uh, in a little bit. So this is a modern talk, right? And so you can't get away without showing some sort of hello world. Uh, now my variant of this today is a sort of a hello bioinformatics world. And uh, I would say that one of the sort of most basic things that we do in bioinformatics is uh, something called sequence alignment. Now, from uh, you know a high-level view, sequence alignment is really just taking a couple of files, processing it uh, often for a long period of time, and then returning some result. Uh, and so this is how you would do this in Reflow. And as you can see, this looks like an ordinary program in many ways. It has the kind of normal affordances. We have value bindings, we're defining a function. Uh, we are uh, creating file references. These are the kinds of things you would see in ordinary programming. And, and this is effectively what Reflow allows you to do. Now, Reflow's sort of magic ingredient is this notion of being able to invoke external, um, external binaries, which is what you're seeing in this, in this exec um, expression. And we'll get into that a lot later. But the thing to note for now is that uh, the exec expression integrates seamlessly with the rest of the environment, right? I'm referring here to things that are inside of my lexical scope, and I'm programming just like you know I might, might in, in, in an ordinary language. So let's get a little bit into why, why we decided to go uh, or take this approach about it. So again, and, and I think I'll probably stress this you know, three or four more times in this talk, if there's one thing that I want you to take away, it's that workflows are, are really just programs. They're, they're, we shouldn't really think of them as, as dependency graphs uh, or, or anything else. We're really just programming some data processing tasks. So that was sort of uh, one of the principal motivations for, for why we decided to uh, pursue Reflow. Another really important thing uh, is that we wanted to impose a strong data model that gives us a lot of leverage down the road. And we'll also get into the implications of that in, in just a little bit. Another really, really important thing to us was that we wanted to make Reflow very, very simple to use, both in terms of using it as a, a tool to program these data processing tasks, but also in terms of operations, right? Uh, in 2018, we have effectively APIs to our data centers, and it seems like we should be able to make use of those to effectively encapsulate infrastructure concerns in this runtime, right? And so Reflow's runtime sort of expands to the data center, if you will, and I'll also get into a little bit of that later. And then finally, uh, another observation that we sort of made down the road is that, that data really deserves an API. A lot of what we do uh, with data processing in, in a sort of traditional sense is on a very ad hoc basis. Maybe you're, you're processing a bunch of files and you, you put them over there and you have to keep track of you know, where those outputs are and then perhaps you use those as inputs somewhere else and so on and so forth. Uh, Reflow allows us to, to effectively put an API on that data uh, because of its data model and because of a few other things that we'll get to as well. And so I think those are sort of, these are the primary motivations for why we decided to create yet another system, though I think it's different in many important ways from, from the existing systems out there. So what were our goals? So first again, we wanted to make sure that data engineering tasks could make use of, you know, effectively the tools of modern software engineering. You want to be able to write modules that are well encapsulated. You want to test them. 
Uh, you want to be able to reuse them across tasks, things like this. Uh, and again, you want to make sure that uh, cluster computing and reflow is a, a seamless process. Reflow really should just work. You should be able to run reflow, and it should do its thing, and you should get the results, just as you would run, say, a Python interpreter and a Python script. Right? Really, there shouldn't be no difference. Another important goal for us was uh, to have a, a high degree of safety. Uh, in Reflow, this is primarily um, uh, primarily achieved through type safety, right? And especially in these uh, long-running tasks, it's a real big bummer just to, to you know, discover that you have a typo you know, five hours into a data processing task. And so static type, safety, static type safety sort of takes on a somewhat elevated importance because of this. We also wanted to make sure that uh, Reflow uh, exposes a very strong data model that permits us to perform incremental computation. And uh, of course, I'll get into more of that later as well. And also, we wanted to make sure that Reflow had a, a minimal dependency footprint uh, so that we could easily port it from different cloud providers, as an, as an example, and keep things really, really simple. So even with those goals in mind, like why, you know, why do you have to build a new system? Why do you also have to build new things? Well, in this, these, this case, I think that these properties are really quite fundamental. It's, uh, you can't really bolt them onto an existing system. There are fundamental assumptions that are made you know, in the data model, in the, in the runtime, in the cluster computing system that we really just can't bolt onto existing system. Another observation that I'd like to make, and I, I hope to impress upon you today, is that by being able to co-design language in a runtime, we really can make something that's much, much simpler um, than the sum of its parts, right? And so uh, because we're able to kind of tackle this problem uh, from a sort of more holistic point of view, uh, or a vertically integrated point of view, I should say, uh, we can build a system that has just much, much reduced systems complexity. And, and finally, uh, again, kind of harping on this point again, but uh, being able to, to provide effectively what are APIs to your data gives us a lot of leverage down the road, uh, and that's actually even surprised us in many ways. So before we go any further, I want to give just a, you know, almost a silly demo, but one that gives you a bit of a feel for what it is like to use Reflow in practice, because it's sort of hard to It's a, it's a little bit hard to uh, sort of put, it, put into words, I guess, the experience of, of using a system like this. Um, so <clears throat> this is a, a repo program that is perhaps the simplest program that, that you could write. Uh, this font is big enough. You want to make, make it a little bigger. And all this is doing is uh, computing the string hello world in the most convoluted and most expensive way possible, which is inside of a, a Ubuntu Docker image, right? And what this is saying is it's saying, well, execute this command, echo hello world, place the output of echo hello world, hello world, in out. What is out? Out is the declared output file of this exec. For this task, we're going to use the Ubuntu operating system. So this is just a Docker image. If you're familiar with this, Ubuntu is a sort of globally meaningful name in Docker. And I'm going to reserve a, a gigabyte of RAM and a single CPU. Okay. So clearly a bonkers way to say hello world, but nevertheless, we're going to do it. So what happens when I run this in Reflow? Well, what you'll see happen is that um, it's decided that, oh, actually this was cached because I, uh, I ran this before. Uh, incremental computer, yeah, right there. Let's just add spaces here. All right, so what happens if I, if I run it now? Well, it's decided that I need to compute it, and so uh, it now goes and out on, on the EC2 spot market, and it's now made a spot build, uh, bid for a C5 but large instance type. It's currently awaiting fulfillment for that. Again, I told you, don't ever compute Hello World this way, but uh, this is a special, Jane Street special, I'll do it. Uh, uh, now it's booted this instance, we have an instance now, and it's, it's now just waiting for uh, the system to boot become available and you know any second now we'll be able to run this very important command on that system. Uh, but again, like one thing I want you to sort of take away is that all I did to do this was to to run reflow run and my my reflow script, right? All I have in my environment are credentials, nothing else. Right? Reflow takes care of the rest. It's provisioning this infrastructure as needed and, and running this command uh, when it finally goes through. Look here now it's finally ready. Um, and 
it should completely any time. There we go. And uh, the results, so within replo, um, files are represented by the digest of the contents of those files. This is just an abbreviation of that. So we can now actually go in and see what, um, what the output of that was. Uh, and it should print. Yeah, there we go. So there you go. That, that, that's reflow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, All right. So I'm, I, I, I hope this is going to, this will probably be the last time I tell you guys this, but workflows are ordinary programs. It's probably the fifth time, sixth time. So let me go into a little bit more detail about that right now. So what I mean by that is that we really want the affordances of ordinary programming, at least if you consider ordinary programming functional programming. And so we want to have abstraction, you know, means of abstraction. So we want to be able to define functions and modules and things like this. Um, we also want to have static type checking for the reasons that I explained earlier. Right? And Reflow has a, a very simple, uh, locally inferred structural type system. And this uh, sort of gives you typing without too much typing, which is nice. Uh, we, of course, want to be able to seamlessly integrate all the kinds of third-party tools that, that you might want to use in your uh, computation tasks. And we want to kind of hit the right power to complexity balance, right? Um, and we want to make sure that Reflow is sort of powerful enough to express most of the things that you might want to do in workflow programming. But maybe it shouldn't be turned complete, right? We want to make sure that we're, we're sort of being fairly principled about what the sweet spot for reflow is. Right? And another thing that's really, really important to us, and in particular because it started out as a team of one, which is myself, is that we really wanted to focus on simplicity and, and really make simplicity one of the, the kind of primary design goals of, of, um, of reflow itself. And when I say simplicity, I, I mean not just of the you know, language and use and things like this, but of the implementation. Right? Uh, and finally, we wanted to minimize the set of external dependencies that we depend on so that the reflow remains sort of uh, flexible and portable so we can port it across uh, to different cloud providers and, and different uh, backend infrastructures. Let's go a little bit over the language basics that reflow provides. Right? And so again, here we have things that you're probably very familiar with from just modern programming, right? Uh, there's probably a bunch of Camel programmers, programmers in this room. There's probably also a bunch of people familiar with JavaScript uh, and, and perhaps even Go. Uh, I think Reflow syntax is a bit of a mishmash of those three things, right? And so we have things like you can have value bindings, right? And you'll notice that um, I didn't have to type out the, the type of these bindings or infer for us, right? I have things like records. Right, so I can assign names to values in a record. Um, I can have tuples, very important for functional programmers. Right, so I have tuples. Uh, I can have lists and maps. And uh, I can also have uh, things like file references. So the value of f in this, this case is a reference to you know, this particular file, which is in some bucket on S3. We can have, we have functions, right? And so I can, I can abstract over some piece of code and, and uh, pass parameters into this function. And also, uh, similar to, to a lot of uh, functional programming languages, as, as well as modern JavaScript, uh, where there is a way of uh, constructing types, you can also destructure them. Right? And so in this case, I can destructure a record, or I can destructure a tuple, ignoring the fields that, that I don't need. Reflow also has blocks. And so uh, this allows you to group together a set of bindings that are local to that block and whose lexical scope is limited to that block. Blocks always end in some expression, which is the result of that block. So very, again, very familiar from other modern languages. Um, repo conditionals are also expressions, and so you have, they always have to have both branches, right? Uh, in this particular case, uh, it's taking some list and, and inspecting the size of that list. If it's one, then I'm just returning it. If it's, if it's not one, then I'm merging all the elements and returning some, you know, some merged uh, value. Now, what I've shown you so far is you know, not unlike you know, other modern programming languages that you might encounter today. You sort of definitely borrowed a lot from uh, what you might consider modern programming language practices. 
Now we're reflow special, and, and really the only thing that distinguishes it from, 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 from other languages is this notion of an, of an exec, right? And this is how reflow invokes external tools. And the way exec inspection, uh, <clears throat> expressions are constructed is that they may return a tuple of, of uh, values. Uh, those values may have types, uh, either file or directories. And so the, <coughs> um, the command that's run inside of these execs uh, can populate those files and directories. And again, uh, things inside of execs can interpret, interpolate directly from its lexical environment. So in this particular case, I might have some file that's just declared in my environment. And I can use that file directly in the exec. But in this particular case, I'm placing, you know, I'm just copying this, the contents of this file effectively to this output. Um, and when this is actually run by the runtime, this effectively materializes to what is in effect a random path. You can't rely on that path being you know, a particular name or shape, right? Uh, and the same is true of the output. Right? And so uh, this gives us now a way to abstract away these identifiers and, and file names and things like this from the program. Execs can also have multiple outputs as well as inputs, of course. Uh, and so in this particular case, I might have a, a decompression program. And perhaps, uh, you know, this is actually a bad example. I probably should say compress because you wouldn't specify a level for decompression. But, uh, but, but anyhow, level is a, an integer, right? And I can pass that in like it's interpolated as an integer. And in this particular case, I'm uh, outputting both an output directory as well as a log file. Right? And so I can have multiple outputs. The type of this expression is this tuple, a directory and a file. All right. Reflow has a number of affordances to uh, sort of allow for, 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 brief, for, for um, uh, more succinct code but I think in a way that, that doesn't compromise on clarity. And so generally speaking, uh, things like, you know, where you have some sort of labeled argument, like a, a record or an exec or a module instantiation, which we'll get into, uh, or even a function invocation, uh, you can omit the label if the label is the same as the identifier that's in the environment. So for example, constructing this record ABC is equivalent to constructing this record. And, and the same is true of these structures. This is again, uh, you know, uh, borrowed from uh, a lot of other modern programming languages. Another really important task uh, that that we often need to perform in in data processing workflows is to be able to operate over lists or collections of things. The primary way to do this in Reflow is through uh, comprehensions, and this is borrowed directly from uh, you know Erlang, Python, Haskell, those sorts of things, right? And that's all the same kinds of features. So in this particular case, I might have a function that aligns a pair of input files. Right? Again, kind of going, doesn't really matter what, this, what it does. Maybe I have a, um, a list of samples. The sample has a, a name and a, a set of files that are the, the sequence files for that sample. And maybe also a list of inputs that are just directly the, the sequence files. What this uh, comprehension computes is effectively just mapping this alignment function over those inputs. right? But the nice thing about comprehensions is that they allow you to kind of mix destructuring with iteration, right? And this is a very nice and succinct way to express a lot of computational tasks over collections of things. And they could be maps and lists or whatever else. Uh, in, this, in this second case, I'm taking all the samples, taking out the files, and then all the um, uh, in, in files, in this case, is a list, if you remember from, from here. And then for all the files in that list, aligning them in turn, right? And so it gives you a way to kind of um, uh, unwrap, you know, multiple layers of, of collections. You can also intersperse filters in comprehensions as well. And so this does precisely what this does, except it filters out names that are named, um, you know, bad sample in this case. But, you know, this filter is any arbitrary expression. It can be something uh, much more complicated. And that's really it for the core language, right? Those are the basic affordances, uh, the basic constructs that you get to um, construct these, these pipelines. Now, as I mentioned, Reflow has a module system, and the module system is also very, very simple. Basically, every file in Reflow is its own module, and each file or each module can declare a set of parameters, right? And those parameters are required uh, when, the modules, uh, when the module is instantiated. Um, 
I'll, I'll take that back a little bit. Uh, if, if there's no default value provided for the parameter, it's required. Otherwise, the default may be used instead. Right? So in this particular case, we have a very simple modulant that just concatenates some greeting with, uh, you know, that's specified as a parameter with uh, a string that's passed in as a, an argument to a function. Right? And so this module exports function hello. And I should also note that uh, we take a, a hint from, from Go and uh, identifiers that begin with a capital letter are exported from a module. Uh, identifiers that do not begin with a capital letter are private to the module. Because this gives you a, a way of controlling this ability of the code in your module. So we have this hello module, uh, and then we have a main, you know, main module in this case. It instantiates the hello module with, with a greeting that's, again, a parameter of the main module, but needn't be. And then finally, um, you know, calls uh, the hello function on, on the hello module. So the other interesting thing about, uh, another interesting thing that, that's illustrated by this example is that if I have an identifier cap, or, uh, uh, capital main, um, reflow run can, 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 can take this module and, and run it and it will evaluate um, uh, whatever expression uh, capital main evaluates to. The other interesting thing to note here is that um, when, I, when I run a module from the, from the command line, I can supply module parameters through the command line uh, by just regular you know, means of flags. Right? And so this gives us a way to kind of have you know, fairly seamless integration between invoking and instantiating and running modules uh, from the command line or other systems, uh, as well as being able to instantiate them uh, from other modules to form a module graph. Another important thing that is provided by modules is that um, they allow you to document your, uh, your code. Right? And so, uh, again, as in Go, comments that are adjacent to identifiers are taken to be the documentation for those identifiers. And so, if I document my code in this way, I can run reflow doc uh, on this module and it shows me um, you know, all the exported identifiers and, and all the parameters um, as well as this documentation. Another thing to, to note here is that uh, refo doc also shows the full infer type. And so you can see here, for example, that this greet function uh, returns uh, a value of type string, right? And that's not something that I had to type in that was inferred uh, for me. And this is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of uh, giving uh, data and API. And we'll get into more implications of this later, but uh, I wanted to sort of show this example up front. And so as an example, we might have some module that computes something on a, on a sample, as, a, as an example. Right? So this is, uh, in our case, an actual you know, Asian sample, but it could be you know, obviously any other thing. And maybe I have a different module that knows how to compute some inputs for a particular sample. Maybe it knows where those inputs live in S3, or maybe it looks something up in a database. And um, the only thing this module does is it, it aligns the data for the sample, and then uh, it also indexes this aligned uh, data, right? But, yep. Yeah. Uh, in the second, uh, in the implication of align, should sample the R1 be input to R1? Yes, correct. So I'm sorry, yeah, this should, this should be inputs that R1 and inputs that R2. Good catch. Um, and, uh, right, and so, so what you have in effect here is uh, a set of identifiers um, that are associated with the module instantiation that actually describe this data. And what makes this really, really powerful, uh, as we'll see later on, is the evaluation semantics that, that Repo has that allows it to really treat this um, as a colon thing, right? The, the expression names the data and vice versa. And again, uh, I want to kind of emphasize the fact that you know, modules provide you know, typing, documentation, compositionality. I can um, instantiate modules from other modules. I can introspect them. And, and also, again, and, and we'll get into uh, a little bit uh, later on, um, the technical details of, of, of how this works and, and why it is the case, the values that are exported by a module are also names in the sense that they really do provide a stable identifier for a particular result. Right? This is due to the referential transparency that I talked about earlier. So let's talk a little bit about how Reflow um, actually accomplishes this, uh, primarily through the, the means of, of evaluation. 
how it evaluates programs. So there's really three, uh, you know, three properties of evaluation and reflow that together lead to purely incremental evaluation semantics. So the first thing is that evaluation is lazy, right? meaning that uh, all expressions are evaluated based on whether or not they're needed, not, not based on um, whether, you know, um, uh, how they're sequenced as an example. Also, evaluation follows data flow, meaning that expressions that do not have data dependencies between them can be evaluated independently and can be done evaluated in parallel. And finally, because we have referential transparency, uh, we can memoize all reductions in, in evaluation and reuse them. And together, these lead to incremental evaluation semantics, which we'll get into. So let's give a few examples just to make this more concrete. So in this particular example, we see that we have, we're constructing a tuple of a, of a string and, and, and a file. The file in this, in this case is expensive to compute. It's the, you know, the ridiculously expensive hello world that I showed you earlier effectively. The, file, the, the string is obviously just a, a constant that I'm, that I'm uh, uh, specifying directly, so it's very cheap to compute. So I can take this tuple and I can do things with it. I can restructure it and you know, take out the string and return the string. So in this case, the actual exec was never actually needed, right? Even though by sort of in inspecting this code, if you were to you know, um, uh, expect normal sort of sequential execution semantics, you would reason that this would have to be executed, right? But it's actually not because of, because of laziness, right? And so this allows for a great deal of, uh, it enhances modularity in, in many different ways because it doesn't really matter how expensive it is to compute a value, I can pass it around regardless, and it's only actually computed if it's needed. Right? One perhaps clearer way to demonstrate this property is, is in this way. So um, maybe in this case I have some sort of index that I'm using for, again, for my alignment task. Right? And computing the index might be very, very expensive to do. And, uh, Maybe I have some dynamic behavior, so maybe I do. Uh, maybe I use the index only if the length of the file that I'm aligning is above a certain threshold. Right? Otherwise, I can do it without an index. Right? Now, as a user, I can just again call align with my index, and the dynamic behavior of this alignment function determines whether or not the index is actually needed at all. Right? And so this sort of gives you, I think, a flavor of how laziness really enhances compositionality because it allows you to not have to reason about the implications of you know, computing these values in the same way that you would otherwise do. And, and I would say actually that you know, laziness, I think, has been overplayed in sort of regular programming, but I think in workflow programming, it's a really, really nice property because the ratio of expensive tasks to cheap tasks is so dramatic that it actually becomes a really, really nice thing uh, to be able to rely on. Right? All right. So let's move on to uh, data flow evaluation. So uh, what data flow evaluation allows us to do is effectively, again, express these computations. And so in this case, uh, I'm aligning all the read pairs from a, a list of pairs, right? And as we can see, there are no data dependencies between the individual <laughs> alignments here. And, and Reflow can take advantage of that and align all of them in parallel. So in fact, if you run this in Reflow, they will all be done in parallel because there will exist no dependencies between them. There's no implied sequencing in the language. And the same holds, of course, outside of comprehensions as well. It's not a special feature of comprehensions. It's really core to how evaluation is performed. And so in, in, in this case, I might uh, export both the, you know, the aligned data in this case, which would be computed in parallel. Um, but that would also be computed in parallel with, you know, with this expression, which also does a you know, different computation over the same sets of pairs, right? And so wherever, again, wherever there's a reduction or an expression that, um, that, that do, or a set of um, expressions that do not have data dependencies between them, uh, they will be computed in parallel, right? And in fact, users can't even express parallelism, right? Like there's no mechanism in the language for doing so, right? Uh, and, and that's kind of core. So finally, let's talk a little bit about uh, the implications of referential transparency and normalization. Okay. And so uh, what this means is, first of all, referential transparency allows us to uh, effectively treat 
the result of an expression uh, the same as the um, uh, expression itself. And so, you know, for example, if I were to do this, which admittedly would be silly, Reflow would compute that only once, right? Because it's able to canonicalize um, these expressions underneath the hood, right? It's not, we don't need to actually compute it twice. Uh, in this case, I might compute this, and then if I later go on and compute this, which would make use of the same index, you see index is interpolated here in the exec, the index will only be computed once because it was memoized in the previous one. And so this um, is obviously core to uh, incremental evaluation. And it's really, really important actually for a lot of the kind of, of tasks that are typical in these data processing workflows, right? So common things like building indices or building models or references. Uh, it's very commonplace to do things like compute them in one stage and then use them in another stage. With Reflow, you don't really need to make that distinction, right? Because memoization is automatic, it's already cached for you. Uh, you can simply refer to the computation that computes you know, the index or model of reference or what have you, and if it's already computed, it's already computed. You don't need to worry about it, right? Um, and uh, the really nice thing of that, about that, of course, is that um, this allows Reflow to track all the dependencies, and so if any of the input data changes, and the index does need to be recomputed, it will. And this is really core to how Reflow makes uh, incre incremental evaluation possible. And, and let's make this a little bit more concrete also. So here's a very common uh, type of workflow that you would encounter in, in lots of different data processing uh, tasks, right? So maybe I have a, a sample and I want to extract a bunch of features from that sample. And then given a bunch of, of uh, features, for one for each sample, uh, I may want to try and train a model. And then given a model and a different set of samples, right, I want to evaluate the model. Right? And so I define three different functions to do those things. And then I have a training set and a test set that are you know, hopefully um, disjoint. And I can build my model by you know, using a comprehension in this case to extract all the features and then training uh, the model based on those. Uh, and then I can evaluate the model uh, directly using my, my, my testing set of samples. So if we consider as a you know if we consider this very very short example, uh, let's consider what happens when we add, for example, a uh, an example to our training set. Well, in this case, Repo would have to recompute the uh, feature extraction just for that additional sample. But then, of course, it has to recompute the model, right? um, and the same is true of evaluation. Right? Uh, if I change, you know, if I delete an, uh, an example from my my testing set. Repo will only have to recompute the evaluation and so on. And this, of course, extends to code as well. So if the code for, say, uh, training changes, Repo can reuse all of the extracted feature files, uh, but it has to rerun the training and also the evaluation. Right? And so Repo keeps track of all these dependencies for you uh, and, and implements purely incremental evaluation. So uh, let's have a slightly more exciting demo for you guys. We're going to create a dog montage, highly parallel dog computing. All right. So let's see. So here I have a um, here I have a module that um, does a very simple thing, a uh, very silly thing, uh, perhaps. It takes a bunch of, of input files, which are huge JPEGs of dogs that I find on the internet. Um, I guess from sort of cattle competition. And uh, what I want to do is I want to resize each of them to sort of thumbnail size and then make a, a dog montage, right? And so um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a good software engineer and I want to modularize my workflow. And so I created the dogs module. And my dogs module, all it does is just export a list of dogs that are dog thumbnails. And so uh, the way that's implemented is the module takes a parameter for where the uh, sort of original size dogs are located. Um, and using uh, image magic um, in a single CPU and, and 500 megabytes of memory, I'm resizing them down to a 50 by 50 pixel uh, JPEG image, right? Uh, again, very, very simple. Right? And so that's what my dogs module does. Now, of course, you want to build a montage, right? And so uh, what this montage does, well, I define a function that can create a montage from a set of images. Again, just using image magic. It has all these sort of neat ways of, of uh, you know, making montages and what have you. I'm now instantiating my dogs module. 
and then I'm creating a montage uh, of my docs. Right? And uh, if I run this now, what you'll notice is that well, we'll go through the, the rigmarole as it, is, as it did before. It'll again have to actually create a cluster. So um, Reflow actually does um, uh, keep instances alive for some time. So if you reuse them, say, within five or 10 minutes, they'll generally be there. But uh, I've talked for more than that amount of time since the last demo, so it's actually has to create a new cluster. Now what you'll see is actually creating a much bigger cluster for us, because I have hundreds of dog images, right? And you want to you know, refill the parallelize that for us. Uh, again, highly parallel dog computing. Uh, and uh, you can see now that it's, uh, I guess, instantiated five, five different instances. They're in different states of readiness. Uh, it's doing it all in parallel for us. And uh, I guess it's waiting to run 120 uh, resizes, right? So I again, want to emphasize that what Reflow is doing here, I've, I've not given it anything other than my AWS credentials. Right? And uh, what it's doing is that it's going out on the spot market, uh, trying to determine what the best bid price to, to, to make is, making those bids. Uh, you, know, you can see that it's even trying to probe for, for EC2 capacity in order to try to shape what those bids, up, bids actually look like. Um, and that finally, when it actually gets to it, now you see that it's actually running uh, all these all these resources. Most, the bulk of the time here, of course, is just taken to provisioning the infrastructure. If I run this again, it'll be more or less instance because that, that cluster is already there. So now you can see that it's completed 80 of my dogs, uh, the resizes. And uh, once it once it finishes all of them, now you can see that it's it's busy making the montage, right? And and that was it. And uh, the montage uh, outputted was this. So let's see what it, um, I, I tried it earlier today. Um, all right, so let's, let's see what we have here. And, oh, shut up the wrong screen. All right, there we go, dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I could now go and change, uh, you know, uh, if, if I now go back and, 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 and uh, change the way the montage is done, like, um, for example, uh, remove a border and run it again, it should be much, much faster because it's already done all the, uh, all the resizing. It should now be able to, um, and also it has a cluster, right? So it doesn't need to go out and create new instances. Um, you can see that these complete, uh, you know, quite quickly. It's just now transferring all the images that were already computed, and it quickly computed a new montage for us with this content. I don't know if this will actually be any different uh, than this is up, but, um, but as you can see, I'm just now modifying the uh, workflow. It took a much, much uh, shorter amount of time uh, because it was able to reuse most of the uh, computation that was done in the previous step. And uh, yeah, I guess it looks, looks like to be in a slightly different order, I guess. Anyway, there you go. Two dog montages uh, computed by your cloud data processing system in a highly parallel fashion. All right. All right. Let's talk a little bit about reflux implementation. Um, because I think it's important to understand how the code design of, of the repo language and the runtime allows us to keep things very, very simple. Um, and you know, it seems like Reflow is doing a lot, but it's able to do so in a highly leveraged way that, that keeps the, the, the actual system very, very simple. So again, it is really, really important to us that we build a system whose semantics and data model really accommodated for a very, very simple implementation. Um, it, we're close to uh, uh, you know, Bell Labs here. Uh, it's very much uh, sort of in the spirit of versus better. One of the ways in which we did this was to make sure that our API surface to external components was very, very small, right? And so we consciously um, issued complicated features or sophisticated features of, of systems like uh, AWS DynamoDB, right? And we kept things very, very simple. Uh, again, both in terms of just keeping the system simple, but also to make it much more portable than it might otherwise be. Reflow itself is built around a, a very small set of core abstractions that are very, very flexible and that are used in, in, in different ways. 
And again, this is all in the service of trying to minimize the overall system's complexity or reflow and keep things very, very simple. Now, this is a you know, very big picture um, sort of overview of the various components within reflow. It kind of highlights the important, uh, the, the important components. So, so first of all, the actual evaluator the kind of command and control center is running wherever you're running the reflow binary. Right? So if I run, you know, reflow run on my laptop, the evaluator itself is running on, on that laptop. Right? So that's one thing. Now when reflow does need to invoke external binaries, it will go and uh, provision cloud infrastructure in order to do so, and in order to do so in a, in a highly parallel fashion. The way reflow manages this is through uh, an idea called an alloc. So an alloc is short for a resource allocation, right? And each alloc has a uh, Docker container daemon attached to it, as well as a repository of files. Right? Repositories and, and files in Reflow are all named by hash. And so the API through a repository is basically, here's a SHA-256, give me the contents of that, or puts this content uh, with this SHA-256, right? And the important thing is that um, the things encapsulated by an alloc, so the set of containers running inside the alloc as well as the repository, uh, live and die with the alloc. And so if the alloc disappears, so do um, uh, the resources that were instantiated by that alloc. So when Reflow needs uh, you know, more additional cluster resources, it, it asks its cluster manager to create a new alloc, uh, which has an API that allows to run these containers and also the transfer data between them. And so, for example, uh, in the montage example, it might have instantiated you know, five or 10 different allocs in order to do parallel processing, and it would now have to transfer um, all the results of those into a single alloc to compose the montage. And that's done directly by instructing uh, you know, the repository, saying this alloc, to transfer a set of files to a repository in the other alloc. Other important implementations of repositories are are sort of external durable ones. And so in the case of AWS, we use S3 to store the cache. And that actually implements exactly the same interface. Right? And it allows us to, uh, again, kind of seamlessly transfer uh, data between these durable external repositories as well as the ones that reside inside of these allies. And then finally, there's just really one more component which ties everything together, which is this notion of an association table. And this effectively stores a source key a type and a destination, uh, destination key. And this allows us to track, uh, say, which uh, values are associated with which XX uh, after they're been cached. Repo itself actually has two different evaluators. And so it evaluates the AST simply by locking it directly into a flow graph. And then the flow graph is evaluated separately. And this allows us to separate the concerns of, of data flow and concurrency from the semantics and, and bookkeeping of, uh, of the, the kind of surface language. And um, the flow graph really just has two kinds of nodes. So one is these exec nodes that uh, encode these run to completion executions. So it could be interning, which is to internalize some, some data, for example, this, store, uh, this might be stored in S3. A Docker exec runs a command inside of a Docker container with dependencies on, on nodes that might have internalized data or other Docker nodes. And then finally, extern externalizes data from Reflow uh, and allows it to copy them out to uh, other systems like S3 again. The mechanism that intermediates these two, or mediates these two, I should say, is this notion of continuation node. And so a continuation node in the flow graph uh, basically allows the flow graph evaluator to call back into the AST evaluator to produce a new subgraph. And I'll have an example um, of how that works in a second. And the way incremental evaluation is is um, uh, performed in Reflow is that first the, the flow the flow graph is evaluated top down until you get a cache hit and then bottom up from there. Right? And, and uh, I think this will be a lot clearer in an example that I have coming up. So here's um, you know here's how Reflow would evaluate a small portion of uh, the, the previous computation. Right? And so uh, if you remember the first step of our, our dog computation problem was uh, we had this list of, or directory of dogs, and we wanted to resize each of them. And so uh, the first, uh, so when the AST evaluator evaluates this, 
it will evaluate it to, into a flow graph that looks roughly like this. So you want to internalize this list of dogs, and then I need to, it needs to call back into the AST evaluator, uh, effectively a continuation node, in order to, um, uh, in order to uh, process that list of dogs again. And so the flow evaluator now starts by you know, looking at the root node and uh, computing its cache key. And if there's a cache miss, it, it continues down. And same here. And finally, uh, we don't have a cache hit for the intern. It has to be computed. And once this is computed, call back into the continuation node, which now, again, will replace the subgraph with the next, uh, with the next step, which in this case is to resize uh, each of those images, right? And so now the, the flow graph looks something like this. And uh, again, we have a set of executions that can now be done in parallel, uh, and then a continuation node uh, that needs to be evaluated uh, when those are done. And again, reflow goes and does top-down evaluation again. So it goes and interrogates the continuation node, computes a cache key for it, looks it up in cache, and uh, in this case, we didn't have a cache yet, and so it has to go uh, further down, right? And so in this case, maybe we had three caches, so we already had resized versions of, of three of our dog images. Uh, the two of them were still to be done, right? And so in this case, we have now to uh, actually run those um, and then go up again to continue and then to root, which now, repl which now replaces um, our, um, uh, the, the subgraph with the montage, right? So now we have a result from all the individual resizes. And again, it does the same thing again. And finally, he ends up running the montage, and then we're done. Right. And so that's a very, very simple example of how the sort of top, top down and bottom up evaluation semantics uh, interact, and, and, and how that achieves both concurrency as well as incremental evaluation through its cache lookup mechanisms. All right, I want to talk about one final thing uh, before I go, which is somewhat more speculative. It's a, it's a kind of a recent area of work that we've been looking into. Uh, kind of again, really, I think giving, um, uh, giving, a, 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 you know, uh, exploring this notion of using uh, reflow modules as data APIs. So again, what referential transparency gives us is effectively that an expression can be construed as a stable name for some value. Right? That's what what referential transparency gives us because it allows us to substitute that expression for the value of that expression. And a module, of course, contains both of, both of, both of those things. It allows us to now compute a key that is stable, again, for the value of that expression, uh, and also compute the expression itself, because it is just the AST. And uh, if we sort of take this a step further, uh, we can think about putting those keys into a namespace, which is what we call a data space. But before I get there, uh, there's one more piece of infrastructure that repo provides that's very useful in this case. So everything that I've showed you, right, uh, has been sort of interactively running uh, these concrete scripts that live on disk, you know, you know, reflow run dog montage.rf and so on. And uh, of course, those are not necessarily stable artifacts, right? So if I refer to, for example, the Ubuntu image, that image could change over time. And so if I run it, you know, today and then again tomorrow, if that Ubuntu image changed, it would have to recompute. Um, you would have to recompute uh, those results, right? So what bundles allow you to do is effectively freeze a module, right? And what I mean by that is it's fairly, fun you know, fairly fundamental in the sense that uh, when I freeze a module, I'm packaging the entire dependency graph of modules into a single binary artifact, and also <coughs> freezing all the external dependencies, and so you know, resolving things like Docker images and so on. Bundled modules are also just first class modules. And so I can, you know, I can run them, I can document them, I can instantiate them from other modules. So this now gives us a name that is truly stable. There's stable and frozen, you could say. Right? This now refers to uh, a computation for eternity instead of you know, for whenever uh, the world changes from underneath. So what are data spaces? Well, data spaces is really just a mapping of symbolic names to bundles. So let's say in this case, um, I have uh, uh, you know, a, a, a bundled repo module that maybe does some whole genome sequencing stuff. Uh, and I effectively want to mount that to some, some portion of a namespace. Now, this name is meaningful just like any other module name. Again, I can you know, dock it, I can run it, I can introspect it, things like this. And 
I, 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 I make the claim now that these are really the data APIs that we've been looking for, right? They're, they're well typed, uh, we have modularity, we have documentation, stable names. Now a really interesting thing about this is that we can actually really heavily lean on the, on the type system. So we can install a policy into this namespace saying, well, if I overwrite a name, right, if I want to update a name, the updated, you know, the updated module has to be a subtype of the, the module that's already there. And this will help us guarantee that we can't break any consumers to that module. And so it's, it's really, you know, provides some really interesting properties like that once you start thinking about uh, data having an API effect. Right? And then, of course, everything is still fully incremental. I can, I can instantiate these modules and refer to them and compute their values, and the totality of the evaluation is still you know, fully incremental. So I encourage you to use Reflow. It's, it's available open source on GitHub. Uh, of course, we use it very, very heavily at Grail. It's, it's what does all of our, our compute work effectively. Uh, some other organizations, like the Chance Archipelago Institute, are also using it, uh, as well as well are a, a few uh, small biotech startups. And again, like Reflow really tries to, to to be a sort of complete vertically integrated solution. <coughs> really, you just have to bring your credentials, and it, it, it just works. At least if, if I've done my job. Uh, and so with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions, and I'll also be around later, um, and you know we can create a set of parallel diamond touches. Uh, earlier, you said that it always does the, the new flow always does the smallest amount of work uh, first. How do you define smallest to get more computations ready that you have in those? Okay, so the question was um, I made this claim that uh, repo always computes the smallest set of work that it has to do in order to uh, compute the desired uh, output. And uh, the observation was well, how do you define that given that you might have more work to do than uh, you have available resources? Well, I mean, so there's internal queuing, right? So what I say is that the top, uh, what, I'm, what I really probably should be, uh, be clear about is that it's the total amount of work that's done, right? Uh, of course, there may be limits on the amount of parallelism that you can exploit in the underlying infrastructure, and Reflow will, of course, queue things uh, if, if, it, if it can't get more parallelism. But it doesn't decide that you have to keep those based on object size, file size, or anything like that? No. Uh, so, so the, yeah, and, and actually that's an interesting observation, though, because it's something that we have been thinking about in the sense that if you want to minimize end-to-end -end latency, you probably want to prioritize work that will unlock more work, right? And, and things like that. Uh, but we haven't really done any work in that realm yet. Question. Did you leave out branching? Oh, did that. Uh, question was, did I leave out branching? No, I had an if statement in there somehow. Uh, there's, uh, it, it, it definitely has uh, if statements. Uh, where was it? Uh, right there. There you go. Here's, here's an if statement for you. Yeah, you can. You got branches. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. Very interesting work. Um, you mentioned that you reuse as much work as possible, but what if like one of the underlying uh, like processes uh, changes their output without the sort of changing? Like you're a bunch of version updates, and suddenly you know you have a new version of whatever right. application. Right, so the question was, like, what happens if the, uh, you know, the underlying image, for example, changes? Uh, well, Reflow keeps track of that, so uh, we can resolve uh, an image name into a, you know, a stable digest that is effectively the digest of the contents of that image, and that is what we use in the cache key, right? And so if it does change, it will recompute it, right? And that's one of the principal advantages of using bundles for so production is that you can truly freeze the, the computation as well. Yeah. What do you do when you underspecify the resources that are required for a particular task? Okay, great, great question. So, so um, the, the question was, what happens if you underspecify the resources that are required for a task? So, uh, Reflow is happy to oversubscribe, right? And so, um, that typically works pretty well for like CPU, uh, sometimes for disk. Uh, the the Achilles heel is memory, where you can you can move, right? And so, Reflow does try to. Um, uh, effectively classify OOM errors properly so that it can rerun those tasks, uh, perhaps increasing the memory requirements dynamically. Right? Um, over time, um, uh, I would like to move towards a model that uh, where, where, where the resource requirements are, are not are treated as hints, not as requirements, and we instead use much more dynamic profiling data in order to make smarter decisions about how 
things are packed and, and, and how reasonable your premise is and stuff. But I guess the, the, re, the real answer is that it, the panels are just fine, it's just that you might do unnecessary work. So we've done a lot of work on parallel incremental computation systems, and one thing we've run into a lot is the difficulty of efficient algorithms, finding good efficient algorithms for really kind of saturating the system. I think maybe one difference is we're thinking about big graphs uh, with lots of nodes, and I guess I guess maybe the issue is that Reflow has very small graphs, so you can just do like totally nice thing. I'm just curious whether yeah. there's anything so, interesting there. So it's, it's actually a great question, uh, and uh, I was actually working on something relating to this thing this earlier this afternoon. So the question was, well, uh, at Jane Street, we've done a lot of work um, sort of making uh, incremental computation of the large graphs very efficient. Um, and yeah, so there's two answers. So one is that generally speaking, the graphs in Reflow are probably comparatively smaller. Right? Um, that being said, uh, there's a couple of bioinformaticists at Grail that like always know how to create huge graphs using Reflow. Uh, and so uh, we have had to make it more sophisticated over time. And so in the first iteration of Reflow, it was the dumbest, most naive evaluator possible. It actually retraversed the graph every, you know, every 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 time there was a change in order to understand which nodes needed to be, needed to be computed, which ones were ready. Uh, now it does that entirely incremental, where we keep, you know, effectively uh, every node keeps a list of nodes that needs to dirty when it's completed and have reference counters and things like that. And so the uh, cost of evaluation is is um, proportional to the amount of parallelism in the graph, not the graph size. Right. Um, but but again, like. Probably even so, we're still talking about uh, comparatively smaller graphs than, than you would in, in a system. Yep. It's a little similar to that Docker image change question, but what if you have a function itself that you're invoking, which is some grant value to the length of time? What if you echo, what if you just echo the time, for instance? Does it memoize the yeah. uh, instance and never computer? Yeah. So, so the question was uh, what if you have, say, a function that um, has a branching condition that um, uh, 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 is, is a condition on some dynamic thing of your environment, like time or random number generator. So the, the answer to that is that it's actually impossible in Reflow to express that. Right? And that's part of how we underpower the language a little bit in order to make sure that it's always correct. Right? Um, and so yeah, you can't do that. That's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. One date. Yes. It will spit out the date. There's no, there's no way in Reflow to get the contents of a file uh, and uh, as a first class value in the in 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 you know, in the evaluated language. Right? So files are opaque to um, right? the actual computation will be wrong. So there will be non well, yes, yeah, correct. Correct. So so we do so this is part of imposing a better model, right? So like the 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 underlying assumption is that given precisely the same inputs, we fix the environment. And we, you know, we fix the inputs. The computation task has to, you know, produce semantically the same output, right? And so if you do have, you know, you, you can produce different days and times. That's fine as long as it's not semantically relevant, right? So that is something that we, yeah, you know, definitely impose on on the user. Um, but in practice, we have actually not run into that being an issue at all. Uh, the, yeah. Um, have you considered um, or uh, any interest in? Uh, so you're putting types are there more attached with the files, and you can imagine yes. what columns are in the table. Yeah, so the question was, uh, we consider enriching the, the types in Reflow itself to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to basically allow for stronger type safety. Um, and yes, definitely, and that's actually something that we're, we are planning on doing. Uh, to the, 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 the first version of that will be very similar to polymorphic variants in Camel, where you just kind of declare a thing, and we cannot type check this on that. So for example, you can just declare that this is a TSV file with these columns, or this is a band file with you know this restriction or headers or whatever. Are you having exceptional cases and what are the notes? And then perhaps if you have certain tasks and one of the tasks ends up in a with an exception of some sort, how are you handling it again? Right. So the question was uh, how do we how do we deal with exceptions and failures? So right now, um, there isn't in the language any failure handling mechanism. So those will propagate and, 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 and kill you know, the, the, the whole task, right? Um, we have experiments that would like effectively keep going, uh, keep going mode so that at least we don't lose the work that's concurrently ongoing while that happens. Uh, but right now there's no uh, failure handling mechanism in the language itself. 
If something fails, it'll, it'll fail. That being said, Reflow does handle runtime failures, and, and like for example, the um errors that I mentioned earlier. So if you have a, like, you know, a runtime thing, like you're running out of memory, you're running out of disk, it will attempt to rerun um, those tasks perhaps in a different mode or with fewer concurrent other tasks running. Um, but if there's an application failure, then there's a failure, and, and, and that's it. Yep. What about the databases? Which databases will cross uh, talk to, uh, talk to uh, relational, non-relational? Which is a database that uh, they work well with yeah, so the question was, uh, you know, what kind of databases work well with Reflow? So Reflow itself doesn't make any assumptions about that, right? So, you know, Reflow itself, as a matter of implementation, uses, you know, DynamoDB to store these associations. Uh, but in terms of inputs and outputs, um, it doesn't really, uh, you know, well, this is really two answers to this, right? So first, you can imagine that in typical sort of ETL workloads where you might be uh, processing some raw data that might be on S3 and sorting that data into uh, a database, right? Um, right now, uh, we do have some experimental support to sort of enable that, but right now in Reflow, we, we tightly control the execution environment. And one of the ways in which we do that is we disallow network access. But there's actually a way for you to um, circumvent that, right? And so if you do want to, so for example, we use this to um, uh, load that into BigQuery, things like this, right? Um, but, but yeah, in, in principle, there's no, um, you know, the, the, you know, Reflow sort of converses in files and directories and bulk data. Uh, and of course, you can run things and load things into databases, but it, does, it doesn't treat that any differently from any other uh, kind of execution that you might do. Okay, so let's, let's hold the questions there. Um, we are going to, at, right after this, head downstairs and we have some, anyone who wants to join, we have some space downstairs and some drinks and some food down at Seymour's right down to the street. So let's thank the speaker and yeah.